So, good morning to all and welcome to the first working session of our conference, Connected Histories, Shared Present, Cross-Cultural Experiences between Latin America, the Caribbean and India. Uh, I will just announce all of you have one very, the first announcement is about the, we have simultaneous interpretation facilities uh, within English and Espanol. You have all got this, you will, just a moment. Press this, the button, this button, the back. Uh, that will switch it on. The default that will be English. But if you want Spanish, press it once more. You'll see two for Espanol. Press two, two and it'll be. You'll get. Uh, so you can put on your headphones accordingly. Uh, I think we have uh, one presentation in Spanish in the first working session, right? And the rest might be in English. So. So our first working session is on exploring the civilizational landscape, social and cultural panorama of Latin America, the Caribbean, and India through the ages. And uh, it is being chaired by Dr. Sudha Gopalakrishnan, Executive Director of the International Research Division, IIC. And we have uh, four speakers whom I will just introduce briefly. And uh, uh, we have Alejandro Jose Gare Herrera, who will uh, is an archaeologist at the Universidad de San Carlos de Guatemala. He is currently a doctoral candidate researching the anthropology of the Americas at the University of Bonn. And he's uh, conducted research and taught in universities in Guatemala and Europe. He specializes in Maya studies with a special emphasis on ancient Maya script and history. Uh, and we're very uh, he will be speaking on Maya, past, present, and future, resilience and transformation of a three millennia civilization. Um, then we're very privileged to have Dr. Ana Maria Gogorna Mendoza, who is president of the International Association uh, Maria Reich Art and Science, and is committed to carrying forward Maria Reich's legacy and the protection of wildlife and environment. She's been cultural manager with Maria Reich since 1987 and has been associated with the conservation of the lines and geoglyphs of Nazca. She's consultant to the National Institute of Culture and to the Museo de la Nación Peru. And for her contributions to the tourism and culture of Peru, she received the Spain Terra Award in 2022. She will be speaking on Nazca and Palpa World Heritage, which um, was recognized a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1994, and the contribution of Dr. Maria Reike, honor honorary keeper of the lines and geoglyphs. Um, then we have uh, Professor Ganesh Devi, who is currently Obed Siddiqui Professor at the National Institute of Biological Sciences in Bangalore. He, he is a thinker, writer, and activist, writes in three languages, English, Marathi, and Gujarati. He works in areas such as literary criticism, education, philosophy, linguistics, history, and anthropology, and has received several awards. He founded the Bhasha Research uh, Center and led the People's Linguistic Survey of India, uh, which was published in a series of 50 multilingual volumes. Uh, he'll be speaking on Shunya Ka Zero, absence as the heart of civilization. Mm. Um, then Dr. Kumar Mahabir um, will be a senior lecturer in anthropology at the University of Guyana in the Caribbean, and I probably mispronounced this, a fellow of the Echo Center of the American Studies British Library. He's the founder and executive director of the weekly Sunday Zoom program hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center. He is former assistant professor at the University of Trinidad and Tobago and obtained his PhD in anthropology from the University of Florida and his MPhil and BA degrees in English literature from the University of West Indies, UWI. He's the author of 12 books till date and he'll be speaking on the influence of the Caribbean singer Sundar Popo on India's music and cinema. And just a few words about our chair. As you all know, Dr. Gopalakrishnan is executive director of IIC's International Research Division. Uh, uh, she is a PhD in comparative literature and drama and has been active in research, policy, and management on Indian arts, literature, and culture. She's founder director of India's National Mission for Manuscripts, executive director of Sahapedia, an online encyclopedia on Indian culture, worked with the Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts and Sahitya Academy. Uh, she's currently leading a project on South Asian manuscripts across India. She's had some 10 books on the performing arts and literature of Kerala and translations from Malayalam and Sanskrit. Dr. Kupalakrishna. Thank you, Niharika, for those extensive introductions. 
So good morning and welcome to everybody for the first session in the morning of the first day on exploring exploring the civilizational landscape, social and cultural panorama of Latin America, the Caribbean and India through the ages. So I won't go to introductions right now. That has already been very ably done by my colleague. So when we talk about civilization, we generally refer to a kind of a cumulative aspects of a region, a country or society from when they started to adopt an organized life. Civilization involves probings about the universe, patterns of life and movement, values and cultural traits, knowledges and technologies that fuel this transformation, socio-political developments that shaped lives, and basically transitions through history. We keep in mind that cultural traditions and communities are not static. They're constantly in a state of flux. And that, and also they're pluralistic, hybrid, and evolving all the time. Civilizations of Latin America, the Caribbean, and India could span from their roots to an ancient past and an ageless wisdom of memory, diversities within the regions in terms of physical geographies, including land and water, archaeological sites and records, rich oral traditions and ethnicities, multiple or rather polytheistic faiths, formulations of scientific phenomena, arts, and other practices. Do I have to go slower than this? Okay. Civilization is not something frozen in the past. It also resonates in the present as a continuous movement. While we reckon that Latin America, the Caribbean, and India are distant in space, with different stories of the prog of progression of life and ways of living and varied cultural influences that shaped our lives, we will see that this conference is about connections. Octavia Paz, the celebrated Mexican poet, once spoke about civilization that its diversity is what it defines humanity as a whole. I quote him, the idea of a single civilization for everyone, implicit in the culture of progress and technique, impoverishes and mutilates us. Every view of the world that becomes extinct, every culture that disappears, diminishes a possibility of life. So these are very potent words from a famous poet. Uh, if I go back to India's oldest text, the Veda, the words Vasudheva Kutumbagam, the, the, uh, is the whole world is one family, comes from Maha Upanishad, one of India's earlier books of the Veda. The verse goes like this. I'll read it in, in Sanskrit also. The whole verse that is. I am Bandhur, I am Nedi, Ganana, Laghu Chetasam, Udara Sarita Nam Tu, Vasudheva, Kutumbaka. The, the distinction that, in quote, this person is mine and this one is not, is made only by people with narrow worldviews. For the large hearted, Udara Sarita Nam, the whole world is one family. So it is not easy to talk in this one breath on Indian civilization. I'm sure that my, co my friend and colleague, Professor Ganesh Devi, is going to do that very, very efficiently. Uh, well, maybe two breaths. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple races, several streams of thought, plural histories, evolving knowledge traditions, arts and culture have built its core. Through history, we have be, there have been exchanges, amalgamations, and ad adaptations into the score of Indian civilization. However, in, th in this conference, we in India look forward to know more about the complex thought and histories uh, and ideas of the, of, and the life of the Aztec, the Maya, and the Inca civilizations of the past, thought systems that developed after the European conquest, leading up to more modern times, with practices and philosophies such as liberation theology and feminist movements. Nearer to our own times in history, we have seen closer contacts, affinities, and common features between Latin America, the Caribbean, and India in features such, such as multicultural societal formations, impact of colonization, mobilities such as migration and globalization. Some of these realities are tremendously important in shaping cultures and as, and as markers of the social, political life of regions. 
So from about the 19th century onwards, there have been strong connections between India and the Latin American countries. There are multiple points of contact in cultural domains such as yoga, meditation and philosophy and literary and performing arts to name a few. Records of voyages around indentured labor give, give us insights when we talk about how cultures are shaped. Indians who migrated to Caribbean countries such as Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago have tried to keep up with Indian traditions and there are stories of how they preserved to persevere to safeguard their memory by uh, and transmit the culture by celebrating festivals, narratives, rituals, songs and movies. In India, it offers a fascinating lesson from the Caribbean countries on how ethnic identities that shape cultures sustain civilization and impact their ways of life. We see more intensified cultural exchanges in the recent past and ongoing in every field of life. We are aware that as societies become more in contact with each other, they become less inviolate, leading to hybridized identities and rapid transformations. So coming to this session, we have four presentations which range from topics from ancient to the modern times. It looks like a packed schedule to me. And, I, with ti and, and we have a time of one hour and about 15 minutes. So I would request everyone to, to confine, the, all the speakers to confine their time to about 12 minutes, going up to 15. And then so that we could have some time for vibrant discussion among all the, all the uh, participants here. Thank you. So the first we have, first person we have is uh, the Mr. An Alejandro Jose Gare Herrera, whom uh, Niharika had introduced as a, from the University of Bonn, an archaeologist and a head of the Mayan Cultural and Natural uh, Heritage Foundation. He's going to talk about my, the Maya, past, present and future, resilience and transformation of a three millennia civilization. Over to you. Okay, um, Okay. let's see what the presentation is. Um, or is the PDF. Okay. So, um, good morning everybody. Kare Pragati Parje, work in progress. So, Today, before I start, I would like to address two small points. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, extend my gratitude to all the organizers from IIC uh, and also ICCR because they are co-organizing and helping with the event, especially uh, President Shyam Saran, uh, Director Sri K. N. Srivastava, Executive Director of the IIC, uh, Dr. Sudak Gopalakrishnan. Thank you for your words, too. And uh, also Sonia Surapi Gupta, uh, Ambassador, uh, Bishwanathan. I'm so sorry. I'm not very good in Tamil. Even though we're cousins, it's hard to pronounce. So thank you very much for uh, extending the invitation, for suggesting that we're here, and also uh, the personnel of the embassies of Guatemala, our representatives here. Uh, I don't know if we have more members of the diplomatic staff, but uh, thank you also for being here with us. And um, well, in general, all of you, thank you for attending, because without you, there will be no way that we will organize an event. Without public, it will be just a monologue, and that makes no sense. So thank you, thank you very much. And like I said, Kare Pragahati Parje. I'm so sorry if I am mispronouncing it. Um, before we continue, I would like to address uh, a small point, and I, I'm trying to stick to the 50 minutes, I swear, I am trying to. Uh, but today, it's very important in Guatemala. We have a very, very important celebration. And actually, uh, I don't know if you know what day is today. Um, today, hola. Today we have the um, International Mother Tongue Day. And I don't know if you know why we celebrate it. This is your home uh, task. There is a reason, and this reason is actually found in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, and it's actually connected with a certain language that is spoken in India and in Bengal. So I will just leave it there so that you can find this for your homework. Uh, in Guatemala, this is a very important day, and I would just like to address a few, few sh short words in Spanish, so in case you cannot uh, understand Spanish, uh, I would suggest you get your headset. Y en español, because uh, Spanish is my mother tongue, so I will try to speak it in this language. 
In Spanish, we have um, a very close relationship with our language. Creemos que la lengua es nuestra identidad. Language is our identity. Somos a través de la palabra, la palabra que viene del pasado. We are through the word, the word, comes from that, the word that comes from the past. Y eh, somos por la herencia de nuestros abuelos expresadas a través de esa lengua. We are due to the inheritance of our forebearers expressed through this language. So just keep in mind how important language is because it tells us who we are in relationship, especially in, in relationship with others. Yep. So uh, just be so proud about your language. I think this is very important both in Spanish, in Hindi, in Bengali, um, in different ways. So thank you for keeping this in mind. And the other point that I would also like to mention is that uh, Happy New Year. I will say where, what? Happy New Year in Guatemala, because uh, the Maya New Year just started uh, one day ago. Uh, a day ago, so Happy New Year for you all. So, um, I'll try to move ahead. When we start talking about the Maya, what we have here and what we're doing today is actually something that we call in hieroglyphic Maya, Nuch Hol. And Nuch Hol is basically a gathering when people get together to join heads uh, for a common purpose. What we have here is a representation of Maya gods. Uh, on the right, we have Itzamnach, who is basically the king of heaven. We have uh, Horn. So the two of them are having a dialogue, and basically that's what we're going to be doing today. We're ha having a dialogue. We're joining our thoughts, joining our minds in a common purpose. When we think of Guatemala and we think of the Maya, this is what comes to our minds. You know, the lush rainforest, the jungles of Guatemala that we have everywhere, and sites like Tikal that we have here on the screen, or Yasha, which are absolutely gorgeous, and I encourage you to visit us you will really, really not regret it. This is not the paid ad, by the way. And when we think of the Maya, we think this uh, huge civilization, these cities in the, built in the jungle, but actually the Maya I, are more complex than this. Is it, is it working? Yeah, S thank you. So um, when we think of the Maya, we have this civilization that's proud in the jungle, but the Maya are not limited only to the jungle. Actually, the Maya civilization uh, it goes through different uh, ecological niches, different landscapes. I would like to address this briefly. The Maya are located not only in Guatemala, but also in southeastern Mexico, uh, Belize, western Honduras, and western El Salvador. So we are a culture that extends beyond the current borders of Guatemala. So this is super important to keep in mind. And when we talk about the Maya, actually we divide this region, the Maya area, into three parts. We have the lowlands to the north, which are basically these uh, limestone karstic plains that we have over this area that are usually less than a thousand meters in altitude above sea level. Uh, we have the highlands that usually extend over a thousand meters in altitude. And in the south, we have the Pacific Piedmont or the Pacific coast of Guatemala. If you cut this in a north-south line, you would see it more or less like this. The Pacific coast is very small. It's basically covered by volcanic ashes. And because of this, it's extremely we have the high mountains of the highlands, which uh, have different resources, like obsidian, among others. And to the north, we have the karstic plains that correspond to the Catan Peninsula and the Petén region in Guatemala. When we talk about the Maya terms of time, you know, chronological periods or pre-Hispanic periods, usually we'll have uh, evidence for occupation of the Maya territory at least from 1000 BC, uh, sorry, 10,000 BC. So we call this period the Paleo-Indian or Paleolithic period of the Maya area, but this is a different story. Today, I would like to address the pre-classic, the classic, and the post-classic periods. Okay. Okay, is this better? Okay, so we'll just turn to the right. Uh, so these three periods are just in reference for the Maya, but it's very important to keep in mind that the Maya are not isolated. Very much like what happens here in India, you have such a huge diversity of peoples. We talk about an Indian civilization, but this Indian civilization is manifested through different cultures and different traditions. South India is different from North India. What you have in Bengal is different from what you will find in Kerala. But it's still, you have common traits that go through all of them. This is what happens also with the Maya. We have the Mesoamerican civilization, and the Maya civilization is part of it. So I just bring this chart to you so that you get an idea of the complexity and the different chronological frameworks that we have to keep in mind when we talk about archaeology in these territories. Mesoamerica, of course, is defined primarily because of languages. This is the Mesoamerican language area that extends more or less from half the, uh, the southern half of Mexico 
all the way to El Salvador, Western Honduras, parts of Nicaragua, etc. In between, you will find the Maya, this uh, big peninsula that sticks out like a small knife going up. This is the Maya territory. And when we talk about the Maya civilization, essentially we define the Maya civilization as a different group because of the language. I insist, language is so important. So when we talk about the Maya, we have to keep in mind that there is no just one Maya language. We actually have extreme diversity in the Maya territory. We're talking about 30 different Maya languages. And these 30 different la Maya languages, you know, they have different kinds of relationships. Yeah, we have different kinds of relationships between these languages. Uh, for example, you have languages in Guatemala that are mutually intelligible, but then you have languages in the Yucatan Peninsula which are completely different, even though they come all from the same root. So when you see the map, I don't know if you get this to see the colors, but for example, the languages that are painted in red, uh, they are closer between them than they are, for example, with the language on top that is Yucatec Maya. This is because all these languages actually sprout out of a common root, and this common root Proto-Mayan is what Sanskrit will be for the languages of North India, to give you an idea. So all these Proto-Mayan languages actually, uh, sorry, all Proto-Maya was spoken theoretically around 4,000 years ago. You know, it's just a theoretical language, like proto the european We don't have actual records of the language, but we know it must have existed. It's open to discussion. We don't have Sanskrit text in Guatemala, you know, that's the small difference. All these languages, as I was commenting, uh, are different in their relationships. They share some common vocabulary. For example, the word for jaguar is alam. And alam can be found through all the different Maya languages with the slight variations, alam, aham, param. Uh, but it's very, very close. So this is what tells us that these languages have a common origin. But when we go to the grammar, when we go to the small detail, the, the fine print of the language, we will see the variations in them. So just to keep in mind, for example, someone that speaks Yucatec Maya will have an easier time understanding a speaker of Mopan than understanding someone that speaks Quiche or Tzutuhil or Ekchi, which are languages is spoken in the highlands of Guatemala. This situation is important because nowadays in Guatemala we have 20 different Maya languages in a territory that is not bigger than UP, Tar Pradesh. So you have to keep in mind that language diversity is always a topic that we need to address. But uh, in Guatemala, we don't only have Maya languages, we also have Xinca, we have Garifuna, and of course, Spanish. To keep this in mind, just to bring it to the table, the relationship between all these languages is like the relationship between Romance languages. And all these Romance languages are connected in between them because we have a common origin, which is Latin. And of course, as I'm a speaker of Spanish, I can understand more or less Portuguese, depending how many caipirinhas have been involved. And um, I can fairly communicate easily with someone that speaks Portuguese, but I will have a harder time if I am trying to speak with someone that speaks Romanian. Romanian is still a Romance language, but it's so different from the other ones that we have a really, really hard time to understand them. To bring this into India, you know, we have the Indo-Iranian languages, this branch of Indo-European, and you can see that, for example, Persian, you know, modern Persian and uh, Hindi are related. We can see it in the numbers. For example, in Persian, when we count is ek, do, se, chahar, panch, Shesh, and it's close to how you will count in Hindi. Not exactly the same, but similar. And these languages are related in between them, but nowadays I think that a speaker of Hindi will have a really hard time understanding Persian, even though they have a common origin. And this, of course, has to be connected with the fact that the languages that are spoken in North India, they are all related because they all descend from Sanskrit. You know, you have the relationship between, let's say, Bengali, Assamese, or Hindi. They are all related, they have a common origin, but this doesn't mean that a speaker of Bengali will understand Hindi if they didn't study it, you know? So this is just to keep in mind, this is the same situation with the different Maya languages in Guatemala and Mexico. So the Hispanic periods of the Maya civilization are quite diverse. I would like to address the three main uh, subdivisions. We have the classic, sorry, pre-classic period, which is the bigger one, it's about 2,200 years. Uh, we have the classic period, which is about seven centuries old. Then we have the post-classic, and I will talk briefly about all of them. In the pre-classic, we have a... Hola, hola. I think we lost it again. Do you hear me without the yeah, microphone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you need the microphone. Okay. Okay, sorry. Hola, hola. Is this working? Yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, so, when we 
sorry about the pre-class Maya, we have to uh, bring into mind certain details about art and architecture. The earliest Maya buildings are characterized because of one major fact, and that's the fact that the gods are represented in architecture. And usually we have big masks that decorate the facades of buildings. We don't have the portraits of kings and queens at this time. Basically, the public display of power is through the images of gods. And when you see the buildings, like here, you will see that these uh, edifices are covered by these masks that show different gods in different times. Also, the pre-classic period is a time when the major buildings of the Maya civilization have been set up. We mean that the biggest constructions throughout all of Maya history were actually built in the earliest periods. And for example, just to give you an idea, this is the complex of the Mirador in Guatemala, and the whole complex of the Mirador pyramid, sorry, uh, La Danza in the Mirador, La Danza complex is as big as the whole complex of the Giza pyramid. For a long time, we have thought that this is actually a natural mountain, but it is actually a modified mountain with a lot of artificial construction over it. So it's one of the biggest man-made constructions in the world, you know? And we're talking about pre-industrial societies, which is a major thing that we need to address at some point. The characteristic also of the architecture. So can I quit the interpretation? Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Hola? Sorry, I'm so sorry, it's just, um, how many microphones have been in already, three? So um, coming back to the uh, architecture, we have the stucco, stucco which is modeled uh, in the pre-classic times, and you can see how elaborate and delicate these works of art are. And this is just to give you an idea, this is a pool, and in this pool we have decorations that correspond to animals and also to supernatural beings. These are characters that are impersonating gods. These are the, this is the god of water, but these are people dressed as the god of water. Also, the, something that is very important for this time period is that we actually have the first evidences of Maya writing. And we know that Maya writing was already a very well-developed system between 300 and 100 BC. So this uh, writing system has been found in the earliest examples coming from San Bartolo. San Bartolo is a small archaeological site in the northeast of Guatemala. And as you can see, we have very elaborate uh, paintings. These are mural paintings, uh, more or less in a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio, to how you see it right now in the screen. And these show uh, different uh, scenarios related to the cycle of the Maize God, you know, the death and rebirth of the Maize God. Also, we have examples of kind of sacrifices that will become very popular or very important throughout the classic period, like this, uh, you know, this is a bloodletting sacrifice that is performed by Huna Hao, which is one of the hero twins uh, of the classic Maya period. And he's performing a, this blood sacrifice from genitalia, which will be actually one of the performances that is very common by Maya in later periods. Also, as I was saying, there are no kings and um, there are no kings and queens. It's easier if I just step here. Yeah. I think that because I see that you are having trouble with the mic. Uh, this is the, is this better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I will not move that much. Hola. Sorry. So um, as I was saying, we have in the pre-classic period all these portraits of kings and queens, but they are not named. They are no reference to historical figures. What we have is the fact that these characters are actually dressed as gods. And when they take on all this dress and they take the mask and they take the, um, you know, the clothings of the gods, they will become the gods themselves. In the classic period, we have a dramatic shift in the representations and we have a shift from the all the representations of the gods, which are everywhere in the public display, to the representation of the kings and queens. And we have a lot of historical narratives that just tells us, you know, this is the king of Tikal who was married to this girl that comes from this place. He waged war against these enemies and he had these and these sons. So that shift is clear from the supernatural world that is publicly displayed everywhere to the historical narratives in the classic period. We have this combination of text and inscriptions, which is very, very different from the pre-classic because now we know who the characters are, who are the people represented here, where, where they are, what are they doing, because the text that you can see next to them or associated with their images uh, are actually telling us all this information. And of course, these texts are used by Maya kings and queens, by the royal dynasties for propaganda. They want to showcase what they do, especially rituals. For example, the image in the center shows us a woman who is performing a bloodletting sacrifice by passing a thread through her tongue just to get lots of drop into the paper that is in front of her. Later, this paper will be burned as part of a ceremony, as an offering. Or the king that is to the right here, he is wearing a mask. Actually, the Maya represent 
the wearing of masks uh, by these kings with this x-ray motif is basically a side way. You know, you have the mask in front and the face behind it. And at this moment, this king is actually the god himself. We know this because the text tells us he is personifying the god. So the classic period has this strong emphasis on historical characters or historical narratives. We know who is married to whom, who waged war with whom, and basically this is the dramatic shift from the pre-classic to the classic period. Also, we can see the developments in architecture. For example, the urban landscape gets very well developed. We have the case of Tikal in Guatemala, where we have these huge reservoirs that are used to keep water during the summer. And this is a major achievement of uh, hydraulic engineering because the limestone in Guatemala, in the northern lowlands, is basically a sponge. It will drain all the water down. And keeping the water in surface uh, is actually quite hard. So the way that the Maya basically impermeabilize the soil so that the water will not go down is a hydraulic achievement, you know. Another point that we have to address is that the classic period is actually a period of fragmented uh, political geography. We have the Maya kingdoms were never unified. We never had an Ashoka. We never had a huge uh, empire that got everybody together. We actually had a small city-states that were fighting through centuries, not, not simple decades, I mean centuries. And all these small kingdoms were ruled by kings that were close to gods in a certain way similar to what you have with the pharaohs of, of Egypt. You know, they are partially divine. And how do we know this? Basically because we can read the hieroglyphs. And you can see that here we have the title that is Kuhul Ahau. And the Kuhul Ahau is basically a divine ruler, a divine uh, ruler of a, a X or Y kingdom. The name of the polita is usually represented by something here in the middle. And this is what we call an emblem glyph. And we have different emblem glyphs coming from different cities. We can count around 200 from very small sites all the way to the biggest sites. So different kings always claim to be divine, and this mark a different status among them. You can think of this somehow like a different caste, uh, comparing it to the historical situation here in India. But it's not exactly the same. But the idea was that the kings were different from normal humans, and that's why they were big kings. Uh, these kings and queens, they of course were part, were take part in ceremonies, in rituals, in royal courts. And we know more about them because we have different archaeological discoveries that we can talk about, like this uh, collection of classic ceramic figurines that come from El Peru Huaca. And in this collection, we have a small representation of all the members of a classic Maya court, like this boxer who is a dwarf. And we have the small detail that he can remove the helmet. You know, this is super attractive. This is like a small playing set for a kid. I, I really love them. I mean, if you can see these figurines one time, you will just be impressed by the amount of detail in a very small piece. But we also have the representations of the kings and, of course, the queens. And the Maya were actually very good at playing the political games. And in this case, this queen, whose name is uh, Lady Kabel, or Ish Kabel in Maya, uh, is a queen that comes from the Khan Politai. So she is the daughter of the most important king of the time. And she is sent to a minor archaeological site, to a minor kingdom, to subdue this kingdom, to keep them on the side of the Khan Politai. It's a way of forging an alliance. And in this case, Lady Cabel marries to a noble king that is lesser than her, but by doing this, she guarantees that this kingdom will be still on the side of her father. This is just to give you an idea of how they will look like, you know, with all the dresses, the feathers, etc. Who was her father? Her father was Yuknom Chen, you know, Yuknom Chen the Great. What does the name Yuknom Chen mean? It means the earth tremble, the one who makes the earth quake. Because he's so powerful, you know, that every step, people will notice he's there. You know, he's the big man of the scene. And Yugnom Chen is basically the most important Maya king that we know of. And he ruled in the, from the Maya side of Calakmul, that today is Campeche in Mexico. And he is known as the great king that ruled for 50 years. You know, he's kind of like the Akbar of, uh, you know, I don't know, 7th century Guatemala. The hegemony of the Khan dynasty was actually challenged later by the Tikal polity, and a king that's known as Hasao Chankawil actually defeated the successor of Yugnam Chen. And this is the character here so that you get an idea of how he looked like. The post-classic period is actually completely different. We have a period of retreat. The Maya civilization had to decline, and the people had to move, and they move into fortress sites. Also, from the post-classic period is where uh, we get the four surviving Maya codices, one in Mexico, just to, for the Mexicans that are here. If you can see it, it's in the National Anthropology Museum. 
Uh, we also have a codex in Paris, we have a codex in Madrid, and we have a codex in Dresden. You know, they were plundered from the Maya, low, from the Maya sites and taken to Europe uh, during the colonial period. And we know that actually there were extensive libraries in Guatemala and in, in Mexico. They just, well, were destroyed or disappeared. These fortress sites from the post-classic period, uh, you know, for example, we have here Ishimche, where basically it's more citadels where people could take refuge during times of warfare. And this uh, Ishimche is a small uh, and very characteristic site of this time. And as you can see in the map, it's basically on the top or, or in the hilltop, you know, it's a small fortress. Another element that we can see in the post-classic period is that the people adopt a lot of Mexican elements in their traditions, especially mural painting. So Maya murals, uh, arts in general, was strongly influenced by central Mexico at this time. It's still Maya, but with elements that come from for, for foreign sites. We can think of this, for example, with the art of I uh, India. You know, you have the Gandhara art, which is strongly influenced by Indo-Greek styles, you know, coming all the way from Greece. It's still uh, Indian art, but influenced with something that comes from the outside. It's basically the same situation with the Maya. Of course, it is very important that we keep in mind that uh, the Maya didn't disappear. Uh, they endured during the colonial period for almost 300 years. And um, they adopted and adapted different things that the Spaniards brought in, you know, like Christianity. It was adopted by the Maya, but it was adapted in their own terms. During the colonial period, we also have the production of the Popol Vuh. And this is the major document that serves as reference for historical Maya information, you know, in general. We have a lot of data that comes from these documents. The Maya were not passive in their, uh, you know, during the colonial period. They're actually, we had several rebellions that happened, major rebellions, like the one in 1857 here in India. We have something like that in 1712. We have something in 1820 and so on. And also, we need to keep in mind that the Maya were, um, okay, that the Maya also endured through the Republican period, the period of independence, uh, you know, in the contemporaneous states of Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, different situations of violence, because there is still this uncomfortable relationship between the indigenous population and the national states. And I just want to address that there are three main episodes that we should keep in mind. We have the Guatemalan Civil War, which was you know, a major conflict within the Cold War from 1960 all the way to 1996. We have the Caste War in the Yucatan Peninsula that basically created an independent Maya kingdom in the Yucatan Peninsula from 1847 all the way to 1901. And we still have the Zapatista uprising that happened in Mexico, in Chiapas, in San Cristobal de las Casas in 1994. So the Maya are still in this struggle for a right to have a future, for a right to be citizens within their own countries. And this is something that we just need to keep in mind. And I will just go very quickly uh, through the main characteristics of the Maya civilization through time. And among them is a key feature that's, you know, Indians love rice. You really love rice. We love corn. <laughs> corn is the main staple. And corn is so important that actually it was a god for us. And still people will address it with a lot of reverence. You know, when you have the crops of corn, there's a lot of rituals involved with it. And yesterday we had this wonderful presentation of Indian dances. And you could notice that the girls were moving their hands so artistically. The Maya corn god was actually a dancer. And you can see it here in the center. He's basically moving in these very subtle ways. You know, he's actually moving because he's well known as a performer. And this is culture that is to the right, is also uh, showing the hand gestures that are so characteristic of Maya art. And this is a kind of connection of how universal these gestures are. You can find them in India, you can find them in Guatemala, you know. We also have the usage of jade, that's basically as important as gold or more important than gold for us, actually, because green is the color of life and is, of course, connected with plants. We have architecture. Uh, Maya architecture is essentially built up on the older buildings. So when you go to a Maya archaeological site, what you are seeing is just the last layer of construction. But actually, buildings are built upon buildings. It's like uh, the layers of an onion. The use of the Corvel bolt. You know, we didn't have Maya, uh, the Roman arc, but we have this Maya arc. And another point that is important to highlight is the textile tradition. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna hurry up. The textile tradition that is based on the backstrap looms, uh, as we have them still in Guatemala, in Chiapas, in Mexico, and Maya women still use them, and these are very colorful. And this basically, they, for example, Maya men have lost the different dresses, uh, but Maya women still keep them. And this is very important. Usually women are the ones who are the gatekeepers of culture and tradition, and this is something that we can still see in Guatemala, in Mexico. 
the, the three elements that are characteristic of the dress are the blouse, which is called a wipil, the sash, which we call faja, and the, the skirt, which we call corte. These three elements are usually worn by wa Maya women uh, on a daily basis. It's very interesting when we start studying the Maya textiles that actually we, we can see that many of the elements that come from the classic period, you know, we have monuments from 700 AD that show the same elements that Maya women still wear in Chiapas. And this is just a clear evidence of continuity. You know, this, there's no questions about it. Like what we have here, this is a woman from San Andres La Rainsar, and you can see that the designs are the same as in Yashilan. Uh, but these designs are not the only ones, we have many. And this is connected with the Maya clothing tradition, which is actually very complex. And I would just like to address, and this I think I will be closing very soon, is the Maya writing system, which is the most complex writing system of the Americas, which can be found in paper, in stone, in ceramics, and even in bones. You know, this is very important. But most of the Maya texts that we know of actually come from ceramics. Maya hieroglyphic writing is read from top to bottom, from left to right, in double columns, and it's actually composed of syllabograms and logographs. And this is a very complex system. You need to know at least about 800 signs to, able to be able to read and write if you want to be a good scribe, you know. Uh, the Maya calendars are also, also part of this system. We have the long count, we have the Tzolkin, we have the Hab. And all these calendars have been lost in all of Mesoamerica, but not in Guatemala. In Guatemala, we still have usage of these two calendars, which make it very important because we still have day keepers in, in Guatemala. And they have an, an uninterrupted tradition that comes from pre-Hispanic times. And this is connected with natural observations of the astronomy, you know, solstices, equinoxes. And of course, these observations uh, created the idea of an animated world where the gods and nature are connected. Like for example, here we have a flint uh, spearhead that is actually animated with eye and a mouth. Uh, but the rain god, for example, is the personification of water. This is called Chak. And you can see him here in multiple facets, fishing, uh, moving the, you know, the canoe. We have also the god of lightning, uh, which is Kawil. And one last point that I would like, and I, this is the last thing, uh, we have Nahualism, which is also a belief that comes from ancient times. But nowadays, it's still present in Guatemala. And for example, some people will say like, oh, Alejandro, you have such a big beard. Maybe in the night, you transform into a jaguar. And this is actually being said to me at some points when you go to very remote villages and strange things start happening, people will say like, hmm, this guy might be weird. So in Guatemala and Mexico and Salvador and Honduras, we have this belief that certain people have these alter egos that they, they can transform into. And this actually comes from pre-Hispanic beliefs. And actually the kings and queens in the classic Maya period had the capacity to transform or to conjure these supernatural beings and send them to their enemies, like uh, in a kind of supernatural warfare. You know, we have gluttony death, we have this idea of jaguars, this fire tail quati that you could conjure and send to someone. And I am done. Thank you. Dian Dennett, K. Lia, Apaka, Dan Yabat. Thank Namaste. you so much for a wonderful, wonderful, extensive, in-depth presentation on the Mayan culture, different aspects of it. We'll go directly to the next one. We'll have uh, the Dr. Anna Maria Cogorno, who will be speaking about uh, Yeah, yeah, uh, which, whichever you would like to. Okay. Yeah, she's president of uh, Maria Rich International Association for Art and Science. She discusses the significant work of Dr. Maria Rich, honorary keeper of the lines and geoglyphics of Nazca and Palpa, renowned UNESCO World Heritage in Peru. Over to you. Uh, which is wonderful. Uh, is it a, pres is it a uh, presentation? Yes. Uh, so maybe we should go. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, the people from the, all the organization of the IIC International Research Division and the Indian Consulting of the Cultural Relation, and especially also to Ganesh, Mr. Ganesh Devi, Gopat Kirishnahan, Alejandro Garay, beautiful exposition. Kumar Mahabi, 
It's very difficult <laughs> for me to pronounce, but I'll try my best. Is Maharita Peru. Then the ambassador of Peru is here. Everyone is this. Alejandro eh, and Fabio, please. Thank you very much for everybody to have me here. First of all, I think that we all were delighted with the exposition of of the Maya's uh, history. And it's very important for me, especially, to have here this intercultural exchange. My duty has uh, started in 1987, which was just for a little moment, as Maria Reiche, the Dr. Maria Reiche told me, helped me for a little moment. It's already 35 years for the little moment. But anyway, to start with this uh, explanation, I want all of you to uh, imagine more than 2,000 years ago. So we have to place that this is Peru, our magic country. First of all, we have to settle on our experience. When I followed Maria's uh, accompany her with the visit to the Nazca lines, we have seen lots of trays of horses and cars also by the Spanish time. And this is why we have so many evidence of how the intercultural exchange during the colonial time. It was very, very important in the site, in the archaeological site. Oh. So, to start with, uh, in place ourselves, uh, this was a marine base, basically, before the creation of the Andes. So, especially in those times, what happened was that in the creation of the Andes, all the settlements were settled and created this plateau, enormous plateau which is started to develop a very special configuration over the lines in the creation of them. One of the first geoglyphs that we can find on the southern part of Peru is the so-called the Candelabro. The Candelabro of Paracas, we still don't know what is the significance of this design. Many people have studied it. But this is a very, very special way of uh, design. It is made on a lot of the, of the mountain, which is uh, mainly made of sand, and it is facing the sea. So all this has been thought about, our culture, Paracas, Topala first and then Paracas culture, thought about where to make a geoglyph that would be preserved forever. And what you see in the next part is one time I went uh, to see it from out of the sea. And what I saw when I was coming towards the, 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 the level of the, of, the, of the beach, I saw the candelabro totally white. And we were so, I said it cannot be snow at all because it's a really high level, it's a heat in, in the southern Peru. So what happened is that the sea makes a patina over the figure. And what you see in white is the salt that covers these hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years of layers of salt that seal every time the figure. So to start with, you know that this culture thought about exactly what to do that would be preserved forever. In the history of Nazca, as I told you, you can see exactly the configuration of the site, the whole site, which mainly the whole archaeological site is more than 500 kilometers, square kilometers. We don't have any evidence at all in the 500 square kilometers of any temple in top. We only have the geoglyphs in the lines. So that's why we know that these people who had made them and they are in the heritage 
of the Paracas culture, they have just placed all these figures in matter to offer for the gods of those times. And still until now, we have people coming from the Andes to give offers on the site. So on the other one here, you can see how they were made, the technique they, they had. It was just made and measured by a meter, which is the, the very oldest way to measure. Even in Asia, in every country, they measured the rope or the material with one meter. So the same thing Maria Reiches uh, thought about how they measured, and that's why she stayed there more than 50, 60 years in her research. So here you can see these 500 square kilometers full of lines and geoglyphs. We have more than 10,000 lines. We already made the first chart in Peru offered to UNESCO in Paris, which is holding all our investigation. And it's completely full of figures. What Maria thought is that below the lines in the figures, we have more. So when they, we had lots of floods and, and disasters and catastrophes inside of the, of, the, of the plateau, then they used to create more lines and more figures. That's why we can see clearly in top of a line, there's another figure below. And like this, they had, now they're starting the Association of Maria Reiche in Germany, in Dresden. Uh, we have three universities working with us from Europe, and uh, we are trying to figure with special instruments to find how many layers we can read among that. You know. And why do we, Maria Reiche thinks about that these uh, lines are offering in its an astronomical uh, relations in the site? Because we have a lot of astronomers, and she is an archaeoastronomer too, we have seen the evidence of the marking lines on the solstice and the equinox and so on. And also you can see the hundreds and thousands of pieces of pottery. They had made the most beautiful pottery, that it's from Nazca, of course. They had been done with such a love in creation. And after that, they had thrown it in the figures and in the lines. This is mainly part of the offerings for the gods to see. And this is part of the, the, the way they had pushed the, 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 the earth on the top. It's full of pebbles and stones containing iron. So the only thing they had to do is just to pu push it on the side. And immediately the yellowish clay appears above. So that's the way they have pushed and made and with the cord measuring with one meter each time. Now here we have, for example, our chart. This chart is really unbelievable because we had made a photogrammetric over 25 years. All the 500 square kilometers between Palpa and Nazca, the whole plateau is absolutely photographer through this managing of photogrammetry so we can have it exactly the amount of figures and lines that we have. We still have lines and figures in top of the mountains. Many of those were catalogued by Maria in 1947. So they are registered in Germany. No? So the new ones that appear are because we are starting to put it on the a list of all the rest that we find. So here, as you can see, the problem that we have in the Nazca lines is that we have the Panamericana road in the middle of the site. And this is because nobody knew that there were lines and figures before. This, is, this uh, Panamericana road was made before the 20s. So that's why uh, UNESCO was thinking about how could they uh, for, uh, give them the world heritage when we have this Panamerican in the middle. 
but it, as it is one of the most mysterious and marvelous places in the world, still a mystery. That's why the boats of a hundred people, they just gave their well heritage because of this great culture. No? So that's the main thing, how they have done it also, just like pulling this big stick in top and then measuring with a, with a, with a meter size. So the colibri, the hummingbird, you can see here all kinds of figures. This is mainly 35 to 40 figures that are one of the most important. The more biggest one is the heron bird that is 360 meters long. And the peak is pointing exactly for the 24th of June, which is our greatest fiesta in Peru, which is the, the Inti Raimi. No? So we have the monkey also that has 95 meters long the humming, the 45, and so on. Everybody is connected through all these figures in the site. Who is Maria Reiche? Maria Reiche has five professions. And she's a doctor, PhD, also in mathematics. She's a geographer, physic, astronomer, speaks five languages, in German, English, Italian, French, and Spanish. So in 1932, uh, Maria, as a teacher in the University of Hamburg in Dresden, found that there was very hard changes in the education. Immediately, she started asking the rest of the professors in the university if they felt this change. And it was because already Hitler was advancing in the education system. So Maria decided to go out of Germany in 1932. So she applied to a job in the newspaper that the German consular in Cusco was asking for the children to have a beautiful uh, professor. So Maria applied in eight, during 80 people that applied at the same time, and she won it. So she came to Peru in 1932. And the best part of the life of Maria is that really she was there and Machu Picchu was just, you know, uh, not discovered, but put it in, in a very well situation of investigation because the local people knew where Machu Picchu was. But then Hiram Bingham was the one who put infants in the investigation in, the, in Machu Picchu. So uh, here is the father of Maria, who was the president of, uh, of justice in Dresden. Her mother studied literature in Oxford in England. And this is the house of Maria that still is in uh, Dresden, but it's not hers anymore, of course. And this is Maria when she had two years. And this is Maria and Renate, her sister, who is three years younger. But Renate Reiche, in the story of Peru, especially in culture, is one of the very important because she had helped our government, our, co our country, to contribute to the conservation of the lines, to help Maria, to pay the, the caretakers that we had. We had seven caretakers that keep patrolling the, the Nazca lines. So here we have the two soles and five soles, the first currency in Peru, was in honor to Maria because what she has done for Peru. So we have the two soles with the hummingbird, and the other one is in Chaucato, which is the main bird in the Nazca lines. Then we have the new passport, and the new passport has the monkey. And because of an homage to Maria Reiche, who has done the whole life to preserve and to make it famous worldwide, the Nazca lines. Now here's a story very important to, to remember. Maria in 1932, when she arrived to Cusco, she was delighted in Cusco, it's very important for her because this is the main part who taught her to love Peru because she was going to the ruins every day to see all the sites, Saxawaman, 
Machu Picchu was the first investigation. She did it at the Intihuatana, which is a is a Sol Clark of astronomy. So in this time, in 1933, Maria took a vacation, and uh, during her returning to Cusco, she pinched her finger, the left finger, the middle one, and she had cangrena when she came back to Cusco. And she had to go to the hospital. So when she went to the hospital, the doctors told her that they have to take her finger because of the great damage she had with the cangrena. So then Maria accepted. So Maria has four fingers in one hand and five in the other. And this has a very nice story afterwards. So here is Maria, very young, as you can see, starting to investigate in the lights. But now, the secret. If you can observe what Maria's watch is, she has, in the middle, is the finger missing. But when Maria took about seven months or more to investigate the monkey who she developed, after making so many charts, Maria went into the figure in her chart like a puzzle. Then suddenly she saw that the monkey has four fingers in the same hand as her and five in the other. So <laughs> this, when I was little, I was like, oh, I don't want to see. <laughs> I don't want to see any figure anymore <laughs> because this was very impressive, not for her. But that's why I carry the monkey in my cards as a symbol of Maria. In, in the next, this, this, this part also is very important. Maria was so passionate and so respectable for our culture that she decided to be one of the caretakers also to make the conservation of the site. Because there were coming cows and horses and, and, and people in, in, in the site of the archaeological site. So she decided to put her beetle in one of the places of the lines on the site. And she lived like that. She's preparing her home. You can see there is a mattress. There is a broomstick on the side. And she was preparing already her bed. So that's the way Maria had lived for more than 50 years in top of the stones of the Nazca lines. So here, this is the very oldest uh, newspaper in 1944. This is one of the evidence how Maria is warning how to protect, how she had non-stop fighting against the destruction of this place since 1944. And you can see how young she is. Now here she is one of the very nice evidence the first day of Maria and Dr. Paul Coso, who has hired Maria to make the, all the research in five languages. So this is the first day that we, they went to the lines, which they didn't know that they existed. So they were flying with Elmer Fawcett, who had an airline in those times, and they saw so many traces around there. And Maria and Dr. Coso asked the pilot, what were all these roads? And he said, oh no, they're roads to farms or little towns. But they were curious, so they came back as soon as they arrived in Nazca. And suddenly they decided to climb two mountains. And Maria, she was a very sporty girl. She climbed first, and the first thing she saw was this line, but the sun was setting in middle of the sun. Sorry. Oops. And ooh, ooh, here. And so that's why, um, oh, wait, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, wait. We a mi mistake. Uh, ah, con este, yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh huh, okay. So this was the first time that the Dr. Coles, Paul Kozov called, uh, so looked at Maria and said, look, Maria, this is not 
just a coincidence. This is something very special. So Maria said, of course, today in this hemisphere, the 21st of December, is the solstice of summer. So that's it begins how to start it. For this, uh, uh, the, uh, the investigation of Maria making this uh, uh, the calendar, astronomical calendar. Well, Maria had uh, not only one, but two Ordenes del Sol, which is the most highest, highest medal recognition to a person in Peru. And she has two of them. This is a photo that uh, really I love because this is very important for a person who has fight for the conservation. A woman who had not cared a bit of herself, but only for to keep this for humanity, to save our really culture there. So she's receiving the at 90 years the World Cultural Heritage by UNESCO. So as you can see there also is Dr. Paul Kosok standing in the middle of the line, which uh, it was very important, the 21st of December in the solstice line. You can see Maria bending there, you know, and she's measuring, and she had measured, we have an archive of really, it's huge archive of Maria, not only of charge, but also of photography by her, developed by her. And also we have uh, now a collection of honors in homage of, for Maria. And also we have all that in Peru. And that's the way Maria has non-stop measuring every single little thing that she had found. One of the first things that uh, the Queen of Spain wanted, called Queen Sofia, is, as she is an anthropologist, was the only two things she asked before she traveled to Peru is go to Nazca with Maria and Machu Picchu. So Maria flight with her, and they were very close each other, not because of, of the interest of the Queen. So anyway, they flew. So imagine the Queen was fascinated by that. This is a very famous uh, photo by Chatwin. Chatwin is the one who had made it uh, famous because Maria is standing in the ladder. And this is the way the uh, Venezia, the architectural Biennale in Venezia, 150 people, architects, all of them, chose Maria as an image of this Biennale in Venezia because the way Maria had opened the way of seeing things, and that's the way the architects has chosen her, because normally the architects just look at the place where they are going to do the building or to settle a house or whatever. But Maria, as a geographer, had managed to figure out all what happened in the site. So that was the Biennale on the homage of Maria in Venezia. And you can see how it, Maria had walked kilometers daily. We used to walk six kilometers one way and six kilometers back, so 12 kilometers. At the first time that I went with Maria, I couldn't even walk one kilometer. It was so hot. <laughs> And Maria said, don't worry, you get used to it, follow me. <laughs> so we kept on walking. But it was really a very special way to, to, to be with her, no? But it's a lot of, I mean, now, of course, we know how to go. But Maria had only fruit in those times and a little bit of water. So <laughs> it was like a sacrifice. <laughs> but anyway, very, very nice. So here we have, for example, the spider. The spider is a very special uh, spider, Peruvian spider. And Maria has made a research through the horizon. And he, she discovered how the spider has in the middle of her body the three dots. And this is the constellation of Orion. 
So Maria immediately started a research of astronomy there intensively. And what she had found also is that in many of our cultures, we have pottery, pieces of gold. For example, the Lord of Sipan in the south, northern part of Peru, the spider, a beautiful piece of gold made of a spider, has the three dots of the constellation of Orion. It means that they had this homage to for the constellation of Orion. So making, solving the distance, the three pyramids has also placed the best time of Orion over the pyramids. And of course, in those times of the pharaohs, what they did is to prepare all the paraphernalia when, when the pharaoh was born. But it has to be buried when the Orion was placed. So it's very important. So this is the way that the hummingbirds uh, and also the, the figures, these charts are made in middle of the, of the figures so they can see. The persons inside is Maria, one of them with the helpers. No? This is one photo of Maria from the NASA. It's the first photo from the Landsat that Maria was very connected with the NASA. And so she asked them, if now that you're going, please take a photo and see if they, we can see the Nazca lines, no? So as you can see this, we still have a lot of, uh, of work to do. Maria is still there in the hand of the monkey. And then we have this, the ancient petroglyph is the owl man, which is also a divinity of us, no? And uh, we have the chart of Maria, of course. And we have also the damage of the spider. But after you see the damage of this white thing, next to it you can see how Maria made the conservation so the spider could appear again. So that's a method that Maria. So in, in top of all the figures that all the world that travels to Nazca to see, they can really see the lines and the figures exactly like they were before. This is one of the, the birds that very is a very local bird. We call it the chaucato, no? The chaucato bird in Maria could keeps on since that time making the conservation applied. We had a lot of uh, people intervene, like Dakar and a Japanese company, Fujifilm, who had attacked also our site. We had mining also that we had gone already because we have after that this is the dakar and the worst part i uh, was so close to greenpeace but they made a mistake this time putting these pamphlets in the side of the co of the ho of the hummingbirds and now i'm working on all this uh, sustainability of the water on the aqueducts they did mainly is the water is life so we are working and we are solving more than 35 aqueducts that we are making the conservation. And this is me when I entered, I had black hair. <laughs> now it turns to be a little bit <laughs> more clear. Now here we have the people who had helped Maria, part of my family, and also all the people that are helping us. And they had the Medal of Maria in the Congress. And I had received an award, the most beautiful park in Lima, in Miraflores, is called Maria Reiche. So please come to NASC. I'm waiting for all of you, and thank you. I'm delighted to be in India, and I really hope that I can come back again, always. And thank you for watching. <laughs>
but I would like to request him to interchange with uh, Dr. Ganesh Devi because he has to, Dr. Devi has to go urgently, so it will be good if he could. Where's Dr. Kumar? Kumar? No, he's here. No, he's over there. So could we change, exchange with, okay, thank you so much. So Dr. Devi. As I thank uh, the International Research Division of the India International Center for putting together this fascinating conference. And as I wish all of you a great future for your own languages because today happens to be the International Mother Language Day. I also want to confess that speaking of India in any one lecture or any one conference, any one occasion is a very uh, exasperating, frustrating task. People have been around here for more than 45,000 years and longer. Uh, the uh, migrations out of Africa, Homo sapiens settling down. And we have, as of the last count in the census of India, and that happens to be the very last census for India, unfortunately, uh, uh, 1,369 mother tongues. Every language is a world view. And therefore, there are at least 1,400 visions of India still around. Given this very long past and the uh, uh, mind-boggling diversity, uh, which perhaps we can compare with the Mexican. I was at Chaipas and I noticed uh, similar challenges to uh, singling of memory, making memory monotrack. So having entered that caveat, I would like to place before you a thought for your consideration while discussing what is Indian civilization. No singular is enough. Uh, we uh, obviously can talk of histories, but Indian civilization normally means in the civilization, the Vedic civilization, what followed those two long phases of uh, people in India. The best way to perhaps bring home some uh, uh, intelligible uh, portrait of India, this, this civilization, and I am using the term civilization, having accepted my inability to use it in plural, uh, though it should be uh, civilizations. So how to, how to bring home a, 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 a cognizable portrait of Indian civilization, the best way would be to compare that with civilizations in Peru, in Mexico, in Egypt, in uh, you know the Akkadian, the Assyrian, the, the, the Iraq, <coughs> Iran, going around the world, and the Greek civilization. Uh, though I'll read uh, the notes that I uh, have uh, for my presentation. Though civilizations are highly complex phenomena shaped by ecological, as Sudha, Ji, uh, Sudha Gopalakshan said, by ecological, material, economic, and demographic elements, all dynamic in nature, it may still be possible to conceptualize, interpret, or describe through some iconic tropes, abstractions, ideas, and concepts albeit 
without forgetting that any or all of these will fall short of a complete grasp of the complexities, dynamics, paradoxes and nuances that, that any micro study will reveal. Uh, and yet that path has to be taken for a macro picture. The tropes, concepts, ideas and abstractions which may help in describing or interpreting a large civilization can more gainfully be elicited through contrast and comparison with a related civilization, thus by helping, uh, 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 thus by placing uh, in uh, this one Indian civilization under a comparative prism together with the, Asia, the Assyrian, Akkadian, Greek civilizations, one can arrive at Indian civilization markers. I do not want to get into explaining why the Greek thought <coughs> developed more along the idea of parallel lines and why the Egyptian thought along the figure of a triangle and how India went for a wheel like zero. Uh, had there been time enough, I would have done that, but I'll set that temptation aside. And we just now saw, you know, the, the uh, diagramic <coughs> representation of thought uh, so eloquently. Thank you. The circle, the never ceasing wheel and the ever expanding universe appear to have engaged the minds and thought of our ancestors for long past or long uh, period in the past millennia. Uh, Heinrich Zimmer has uh, used this idea of ever-expanding universe at the heart of Indian thought. But he is not the only one. There are other commentators such as Anand Kumar Swami, many others, who have focused on the idea of zero, the graphic, the circle, at the, uh, at, uh, as one of the most central icons of Indian, in Indian civilization. Since the seals found at various sites of the Indus Valley period have not yet been finally interpreted and have so far yielded only tentative conjectures, one has to stay content with the more recent uh, Vedic, Pali, Prakrut, Dravidian and oral cultural sources uh, belonging to only the last 3000 years while thinking of this dominant trope. Mm. One of the terms used for this trope is Shunya, uh, which has its origin in Pali, not in Sanskrit. Shunya, which may be translated in one of its semantic aspects as zero, because Shunya is not exactly zero. Uh, for instance, the Sanskrit word Shunya Manask uh, uh, talks of empty, you know, uh, emptiness, alienation, almost like uh, Albert Camus, uh, you know, uh, uh, being an outsider. Uh, but uh, if uh, if it's translated in one of its semantic aspect as zero, though that is only a small element of the original Shunya. Uh, it is a key philosophical term in Buddhist worldview. If Gautama's teachings position reality with R capital as a result of how the consciousness chooses to perceive it, And if such a consciousness therefore needs to strive at a freedom from all attributes, Shunya can be understood as the innermost being of the self, the core of being. The same Shunya of the Buddhist 
tradition the pali tradition the same shunya the non conditioned work of the consciousness in its externalized form becomes kho the term kho is not commonly noticed as a very important uh, uh, philosophical concept in uh, indian civilization uh, but uh, ananda kumara swami whose work uh, was edited and published by kapila watts and uh, the uh, you know the initial architect of this conference has a brilliant essay on the notion of kho that many people read it as kha <laughs> but it is kha the the same shunya the non condition work of the consciousness in its externalized form becomes kha an experience kha is related to uh, an experience which is capable of experiencing absence shunya but kha in itself is experience uh, uh, for instance taking a deviant form it becomes du kha and a harmonious form it becomes su kha so su kha du kha the philosophical and cultural exchanges between buddhist thought and the vedic thought had in their background the context of an encounter as well as an synergy conflict encounter and synergy provided by the imagery icons and the world view inherent in the pre classic sanskrit of nomadic pastorals of uh, fire worshipers and for those fire worshipers uh, who were associated with the sanskrit language Uh, for those of the three overpowering images associated with their and with their ancestors uh, these three uh, powerful images were one was horse the other was wheel and the third was word a new language and they they really worshiped all these of these three the wheel turn out to be the most hypnotizing for them they structured their memory of the loss of the of the past using the wheel as the central metaphor as for example in the early versions of the epic bharata which was called jaya or itihasa uh, showing that as a poem about the kala chakra the wheel of time the chakra which has its latin and greek uh, uh, you know uh, related uh, cognates uh, became a very central uh, term of thought in that tradition uh, tradition of conflict and collaboration between buddhism and the vedic civilization the vedic era the wheel was in their imagination complete entire never deficient and this found a refined expression in upanishadic thought in the form of purna which is another synonym for shunya shunya is vacuous so is purna but the but the but the emptiness of purna is of a different category different order purna which is also i mean zero an entity that is nothing in itself yet far exceeds everything such that it can never be diminished nor can it be increased there is a very famous uh, uh, sanskrit uh, uh, verse about this but i'll not quote it uh, uh, because it may not be grasped by everybody present here later in uh, that is uh, nearly 7 or 800 years after this purna comes into play and uh, sudha gopal krishnan actually refer to one of the upanishads 
which positions begins to position